Well, good morning and welcome to Furious Driving. Now, I don't know if you're getting the full sense of this through the magic of YouTube, but it's raining again. That's really unusually for, for England. It's tipping with rain. Who knew? Well, this does put a slight alteration and crimp in my plans for the day, which had been to take this for an MOT. Uh, my plan was to book a day when the forecast was nice and dry, get the uh, convertible to the nearest MOT station I can. There's a, a friendly one, like a nice little village garage, uh, literally walking distance away because uh, with the pandemic and my wife still working, it's kind of difficult getting rides to and from garages uh, to drop cars off, that kind of thing. But also I wanted one, well, if it breaks down on the way, I can walk home from it. <laughs> so yeah, needed local and dry. It's still local, it's not dry, so I'm not taking this car out with no roof to be parked at in their car park until they get around to MOTing it. Fortunately, I have got another Rover that needs an MOT as well, so I can substitute that one in instead rather than messing them around at the last minute and losing them a booking. So we'll take that one today instead. So this car is noticeably not a Rover. It is, of course, the Volvo 740. The reason I am taking this car, not the Rover which is going for an MOT, is because I have once again been um, overstaying my welcome on a friend's uh, drive, God, it's cold in there still, on a friend's driveway, where's the heated seat? It's chilly. Um, on a friend's driveway with the coupe. And I couldn't move it off there because the MOT had run out. Um, and I was gonna leave it until February, uh, but no, as I'm now not taking the uh, convertible anywhere, this is noticeably inclement weather right now. I've got to go and drive to get the car and then drive it back to the garage alone. We're kind of about halfway in between, the garage is kind of halfway in between the two places, so it doesn't really make a lot of difference because if you're unaware of the rules in the UK, if you're driving to a booked MOT, you can drive without an MOT because you're driving to get the MOT sorted and the car is obviously taxed and insured. So yeah, not taking the uh, convertible anywhere in this weather without a roof. And I don't know if I said it in the introduction, normally when I do MOTs, most of the time I tend to go back to my friend's place where the Alfa Romeo got welded up uh, just not long ago actually, uh, with the rare exceptions where I haven't got time to go over to his garage, it's slightly further away, I can't get a lift back from his garage because it's slightly further away, or I think the car's just going to sail through with no additional work because um, he's good at sorting out niggly problems that other garages tend not to want to do. He loves me for that, I'm sure. <laughs> there you go, Trevor, have all the problems. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'll be with the uh, coupe interfrastically, but while I'm driving around there, why don't you have a look at this thing, which was a bit of a surprise. I was at work earlier in the week and I saw this. What are the chances of finding your all time favorite car in a garage? in the UK when you're not expecting it. Anyone who ever asks me what my favourite car is, is always in for a slightly unusual answer because it's not the usual kind of stuff you might expect, like an Aston or a Ferrari or something normal. It's one of those. It's a Cord. So when I turned up here, this is obviously a garage, and saw this, I was quite happy. Let's have a little look around this thing. It is quite a distinctly styled 1930s car. Clearly it is a 30s car from the overall Art deco styling, but look at a few things about this car that make it really stand out. First of all, hidden headlights. That was a first for an American car. They call this thing the coffin nose for fairly obvious reasons. And if you look down here, the front of the car, that's quite a long extension in front of the engine area. And there's a long bonnet to start with, that is a V8 obviously, we'll look at that in a second. But this is front wheel drive. People often say this is the first American front wheel drive car, but actually in 1929, Cord had done a previous front wheel drive car, but it was not a good seller. And this is a bit more advanced. But we'll have a look under the bonnet in a second. But just look at this amazing styling, the way the thing just carries on back. The aircraft pontoon style wings into no running boards. This is a big deal because everything in the 20s and 30s had running boards on it. But this car didn't because it's front wheel drive, not monocoque chassis or anything clever like that. But it is front wheel drive, which means there's no transmission tunnel. They can make the car lower to the ground, they can lose those bits. 
four doors, obviously. Four doors, and then into this amazing swooping back of the car. The owner has just bought this, and there's a few things just being done. And that's why there's hubcaps and lenses missing on it. I always thought the, the wheels looked strangely, I don't know, a bit too busy for such an otherwise clean car. Let's have a quick look, before we go any further, at that headlight popping up. Look at these beautiful handles. And the headlamps wind up on these little mechanical manual winders. Takes a few winds, not too many. I've only sat in one cord before. I've loved these cars ever since I bought a Matchbox Models of Yesteryear model. I think in the 1980s I was given it and that's when I discovered these and thought they're the most amazing things ever but I've only ever sat in one before and that is a car called Tetanus uh, built by Andy Saunders the hot rod guy it's a little bit different but it does still have this stunning engine turned dashboard but look at these instruments let's get closer in on these things just look at the font and the styling on these things. It looks like, well, it, it is truly 1930s adventure science fiction stuff. There's clock, diameter. Interestingly, the fuel gauge, this little button underneath it, actually doubles up as the oil level meter as well. Over here, we've actually got a radio built into the dashboard, the speaker for which is up here in the ceiling. We do have quite an incredible horn. Very nice. Now this, interestingly, is your gear selector. This is a pre-selector or semi-automatic gearbox. We are gonna do a drive of this car in the summertime when it's dry outside. It's horrible outside today, so we're not gonna take it out in this weather, but this is gonna be an interesting thing to drive. I've not driven a pre-selector gearbox before, so that'll be an adventure, but apparently it's quite easy. Underneath this bonnet, we do have a flathead V8. This is a Lycoming V8, 289 cubic inch or 4.7 litres. Not massively powerful. I think it's about 125 horsepower, give or take. Very pretty bit of engineering. But interestingly, here's the engine, here's the fan, here's the massive radiator. Down here in front of it, we've got the gearbox and these very, very vulnerable here in front of the radiator grill, or behind the radiator grill, wires and connections. Oh, this is what controls your gear shifts. Electrical gear shift in 1936. Incredible. And even in the engine bay, they've tried to make it very, very streamlined and hidden the coil up here in the bulkhead. And down here, we've got the, uh, the VIN plate, which tells us this is car number 769 off the production line. And there weren't many of these things. So that was the quick walk around of the Cord 810, one of my favourite cars in the world, absolutely ever. We'll revisit this car when it's summertime and it's dry and we can take it outside, which I'm looking forward to. Well, I've just reached the Rosa. I won't show you where we are, obviously, for obvious reasons, but I have noticed the steam coming out from in front of the radiator grill on the Volvo when I arrived. Uh, this has happened to me before in this car. I'm not quite sure if this is... Oh, oh no it's not. It's not a loose jubilee clip. The end of the radiator has snapped off. Oh no, I need a new radiator before I can drive this car home. That's not a good thing. Oh crikey. Well that was an unexpected pain in the bum. One minute my biggest problem was the fact I've now got a soaking wet car cover which I didn't have anything to put it in or do anything with so it's currently rolled up wet side on the inside in the boot of this car. Uh, and my other biggest problem was the fact that the battery was flat on this and or just very low, couldn't quite crank it into a start on this car. 
and I was having to jump start it. Next thing you know, I've got no radiator on the Volvo. So that is now parked where it sits pretty much because uh, that top hose pipe thingy has just sheared off completely so I'm going to have to go and buy a new radiator for it. Um, whether I go back with a bunch of tools and fix it there or I go and get the AA to recover it home so I can fix it, I'm not saying comfort, but certainly with all of my other tools at hand because I suspect there's going to be some rusted up uh, bolts and things on there. I reckon there's going to be some hammering and some heat induction tool action going on getting that thing off. That looks like it's going to be a pest. It looked okay from the outside, but obviously it rotted out from the inside. Driving down this particularly wet and horrible road today, this Tomcat has got the new Continental tyres on those uh, nice... 16 inch, I forget what size they even put on this car. I think they're 16 inch alloys. So even though it is biblical, the rain today, it's just chucking it down like you wouldn't believe. This car is driving you know, straight and true, it's cutting through the puddles relatively easy. I'm not being overconfident because there are some quite deep ones, but it's, um, it's performing well as opposed to the Volvo where I've only changed the front tyres on it and it's still got a pair of new but ditch findery rears on the back and going around the last roundabout it was very twitchy. Shush. Forget how loud audio cassettes are when they're rattling the tape player. I did bring a handful of spanners with me as well because um, last time I drove this car that driver's wiper did actually come loose and I had to go and park under a bridge and tighten that wiper up. But so far it's been good. Right, not far now. You'll rejoin me later. And then we've got some more news, which was going to involve the Volvo, but for obvious reasons now won't. But it's still quite fun nonetheless. Join me again somewhere different. So this is the bit that would have been involving the Volvo, but the Volvo is definitely dead for the time being. In the boot of the, Ro not the Rover, the Mercedes, I've got something exciting which was going to go on the Volvo, but I'll just plant on the, uh, the Rover for the time being. Check out this vintage roof rack. I'm guessing it's probably 70s or 80s. Let's get it in the, in the garage and have a look. Yeah, just placed in place for the moment, not actually fixed in properly, but what do you reckon to that? It's virtually period correct for the Rover 2000. Uh, well, probably more period correct for the Volvo, which is where I was planning on fitting it. My grand plan, my genius idea was I could put this roof rack, which I have to say a massive thank you to Wayne from Stone Cold Classics for. He actually found it in a skip, I didn't know what to do with it, and I had just literally been thinking, wouldn't it be cool to put the uh, C5 on the roof of the Volvo so I could go to a car show with my 1980s setup of a C5 and a Volvo, because I kind of think that the kind of person who would have bought a 740 was someone who's interested in engineering and machines and that kind of stuff, and may well have done exactly that kind of thing 25, sorry, 35 years ago. So it can sit on top of the Rover for the moment, because it's not going anywhere in the foul weather. That's not damaging it, because it's sat in the, uh, in the grooves. It's not, not fixed on yet. That's quite cool. Thank you, Wayne. That's brilliant. But my, my plan for the summer, get this thing all polished up looking nice, maybe revarnish the woods, and uh, yeah, strap the C5 on the roof of the Volvo and then I can uh, go, yeah, double tap shows with two machines at the price of one. Wouldn't that be fun? Well, let's see if we get some shows again. Well, the, regarding the Volvo, yeah, so that is now, the Volvo itself is now obviously dead where it sits. I can't turn it on again until I've changed that radiator because it's going to gush all its coolant on the floor. Um, so a new radiator is needed. Uh, pretty soon for that car. The thing is, because it was such a cold day, it was you know, under five degrees, the thermostat was probably closed, and that's why it wasn't emptying all its coolant as I was driving down. It's only when I pulled in and the car idled for a couple of minutes. And then I saw the steam out of the radiator and thought it was a Jubilee clip, but no kablowie, it was the corner of the radiator shearing off. Anyway, enough of that, there's one final thing. And finally, the Tomcat. Big question. Which I'm sure you're riveted to know the answer to, did it pass its MOT? That is after all where we started this video, taking this thing down for its MOT test. Yes, of course it did, not even a single advisory. One headlight bulb blew whilst it was on the ramp, but they fixed that. You know, obviously charged me five for a new headlamp bulb, no problem. But the thing flew through, no advisories, no problems. Another year on the road for old blue, which hasn't really got a nickname. So, the Tomcat, the coupe, 
whatever. <laughs> so I was very relieved with that. I'm kind of disappointed it didn't fail on something ridiculous because I've not got any content now. I've not got a video to make about fixing it. Uh, <laughs> So never mind. Um, amazingly, last night it did stop raining for a bit, and uh, I was going to walk up with my son and go and collect it. But we're well, homeschooling at the moment, which is so much fun. Um, but Mrs. Furious came back and wanted to go for a run, so she actually ran up and collected the car for me, which is great. So I haven't even driven it since it's passed its MOT yet. Um, so there we go. Right. So I hope you've enjoyed this random blog of random stuff this week, which has been none of which. That I particularly expected, but that's maybe how the best things happen, or perhaps how the worst things happen. I don't know. Uh, these new hats are available. There's a link in the description below. Don't forget the black ones are available as well. Black with the furious driving writing across the front. I do quite like them as well. They're a bit, bit uh, more discreet. These are a bit more in your face. And I quite like the chunky knit effect of these ones. If you like the look at these, then hit the link in the description down below. T-shirts, mugs, the rest of it are also on the Redbubble store. There are links to that as well. Thank you for watching, everybody. If you've enjoyed this, as usual, like, subscribe. Uh, bell notification, YouTube stuff, and I'll see you again next time when it won't be any of these cars, it'll be something else I expect. Or might be the Volvo, I don't know. Take care.